Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Mary Alice Truitt and I am the president of Out in Public, which is the LGBTQ student organization at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Um, and we brought this event together once we found out about the recent White House uh, policy change around HIV uh, prevention. And so to get this started, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude and thank you to, for everyone that came together on such short notice. We came up with the idea for this event at the end of September and we were able to line all of the logistics up to be able to bring everyone together for this. So um, first I would like to thank um, Mr. Douglas Brooks for coming, uh, Mr. Noel Gordon, uh, Dr. K. Rive Amico. Um, I would also like to thank the Spectrum Center and Linz's help with getting resources together. Um, I'd like to thank Leon from the HIV AIDS Resource Center, or HARC, um, that came and provided some resources out as well in the Great Hall. Um, I would also like to thank Ford School's generous support from the FSPP Office of Communications and Tom, who is our awesome IT guy, who helped us set all of this up. So, um, and so, um, I would also like to thank those that are watching with us uh, streamed from the web. Um, and so in, in honor of November as Men's Health Month, uh, better known as Movember, um, we as students and people with a common concern have come together. Access to HIV prevention, specifically pre-exposure prep prophylaxis. It is now approved by the FDA and available with prescription. The White House HIV policy updated to 2020 states that vulnerable populations should have full access to this medication. We sought out experts of the multidimensional implications of this public health and public policy event. As out in public, we are concerned with the specific elements of this opportunity to reveal a pathway to full access, devoid of prejudice, discrimination, and stigma. Noel has joined us from the HRC to share his experience and perspective working in outreach to the LGBT community. Dr. K. Rive Amico is here to share her perspective within the public health domain of HIV prevention, specifically PrEP. And Mr. Brooks of the Office of National AIDS Policy at the White House is here to share the changes in the political environment that occurred during the development of this policy. I hope that you will also share insights into the Office of National AIDS Policy's goals of making PrEP fully accessible. So with that, we'd like to get the event started. We have note cards that are out. Um, there will be members of Out in Public going around to pick them up at 6.30, and then we'll be going through those, and you'll have a chance to ask panelists any questions that you might have. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Paula Lance, our Associate Dean of Research and Engagement here at the Ford School. Thank you. Good evening. Glad to see you all here on this chilly November evening. Uh, and we know it's coming, don't we, uh, down the road? Um, but I'm really delighted to be here tonight. Um, one reason is that all my research focuses on public health prevention policy. So this, I'm really excited to learn from our expert panel more about this really important prevention issue. But also, I just finished uh, a term serving on the board of directors of the Whitman Walker Health mm. Community Health Center in Washington, DC. Uh, it was one of the favorite things I've ever done in my life. Whitman Walker Health is a federally qualified community health center that's dedicated to providing um, healthcare services and primarily focusing on HIV care and prevention to the LGBTQ community in Washington, DC. So again, I'm just delighted to be part of this fantastic effort tonight. What we're going to do is start by actually having our distinguished panelists introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their background and what their work is within the space of PrEP. So why don't we just go down the, the line here and we'll start with Dr. Amico first. So hello, my name is Rave Amico and I am with the School of Public Health. Um, my work predominantly uh, has been dominated for the last uh, decade and a half or so actually on treatment adherence um, for people living with HIV. And I got a bit dragged into PrEP work um, when early on in the randomized control trials they realized that adherence wasn't kind of what it needed to be. Um, so that was my first exposure and I've been very lucky to have been involved in this um, discovery and innovation and learning process since uh, about 2000 and 10, I think, actually earlier than that. But anyway, so I've been involved with the uh, IPREX trial, um, with the VOICE trial, um, with a couple of other randomized control trials, demonstration projects, and now um, have had the pleasure of being able to have more of an advocacy hat. 
um, and do a lot of work to try to uh, raise PrEP awareness um, and PrEP education as well so that people at least know that there's an option available to them. Thank you. Mr. Brooks? Uh, I'm Douglas Brooks. I'm glad to be here with you and I was telling uh, folks that uh, usually I'm in a suit and tie, but <laughs> since I was coming to a college campus, I thought I would uh, just be in my collegiate sweater. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here with you. I've, I've been at the White House for since March of 2014, so um, moving toward two years. And uh, a lot has changed. My predecessor, Grant Colfax, uh, actually uh, did us all a tremendous favor in that in, in Grant's time there, and Grant's a medical doctor, I'm a social worker, in Grant's uh, time he spent a lot of um, his energy in uh, moving the country, uh, moving the White House, moving advocates to understanding the importance of following the science that the science was the science, and that that was where we needed to, how we needed to design our efforts. And, uh, and so when we prepared to, as we were preparing to update the strategy, the National HIV AIDS strategy, it actually became a whole lot easier for us to include, uh, and I want to be clear that what we advocate is uh, full access to PrEP services, um, not the pill. Uh, the pill is part of is uh, part of a set of services, and and we advocate for that in the context of effective prevention tools uh, across the spectrum. So, and I'll say a little more about that. But uh, I'm really very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Noel Gordon. I am, I guess, the first and most important thing is I am a graduate of the University of Michigan. Uh, yes, that's right. Go Blue. Uh, I graduated from LSA uh, in 2013, uh, where I studied political science, uh, moral and political philosophy, and LGBTQ and sexuality studies. So I have walked State Street. I have walked South U, like many of you do uh, every day. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, the first lens I bring to this. The second lens, and I'm you know, privileged to work at the Human Rights Campaign. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, HRC is the nation's largest LGBT civil rights organization. Uh, we were founded in 1980, and we are probably most known for our work around marriage equality uh, and the Obergefell v. Hodges case, which brought uh, marriage equality to all 50 states in the US. Uh, what many people are not as familiar with is the work that we do in public education and outreach. And so uh, HRC has a health and aging program that was founded in 2013, and I serve as sen a senior specialist. And so uh, I direct all of HRC's HIV prevention education uh, portfolio. And I've been doing that for the past year and a half, and a cornerstone of that has been uh, you know, increasing access to and uh, education about PrEP. Now, HRC was one of the first national LGBT uh, organizations to endorse PrEP. We did so in October of 2013 because we felt as an LGBT organization, we had a moral responsibility to educate members of our community about this powerful new prevention tool uh, as 63% of new HIV infections are among gay and bisexual men and that transgender women are, more, are likely, or at least 49 times more likely to have HIV uh, than the general population. And so these are people who are in our community, people I work with and I live with every day. And so uh, I have the, the luxury, as I said, of, of educating people about that tool. The last thing I'll sort of say, the last lens I bring to this is as a black gay man on PrEP. Um, I've been using PrEP now for close to two years, and that has been a wonderful experience that I hope to expound upon uh, with you all here today. So thank you, and thank you to the sponsors uh, for having me. Great, thank you so much. So we have a lot of questions for you, um, <laughs> and some of them, you don't all feel like you need to answer every question. Mm -hmm. You can kind of duke it out among yourselves. <laughs> who's going who's gonna to answer what? But the first questions really are to just make sure we're all, we all have kind of the right basic understanding of what, it, what really is PrEP. Um, so if one or more of you want to talk a little bit more about what, what, is, the, what is the regimen for someone who's on PrEP, mm -hmm. Um, talk a bit about the issue of adherence, mm -hmm. that's very important, and maybe also uh, explain the difference between PrEP and PEP. The doctor. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, okay, uh, I've been nominated. So uh, PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, and I think the first place where I start is that uh, 
the concept PrEP is different from the drug Truvada, right? So PrEP uh, is a, a public health intervention that has also been used for other drugs, so for exa or other illnesses, I should say. So for example, uh, people who serve in countries where there are uh, high prevalence of malaria can take anti-malaria drugs uh, as a form of PrEP, right? So before they're exposed to malaria, they take anti-malaria drugs to prevent their uh, risk of contracting malaria. Um, so PrEP is not a new concept. I think that's the main takeaway. Um, it is, however, newer in the context of HIV prevention, uh, specifically for the sexual transmission of HIV, right? And so PrEP uh, is a public health strategy, and now Truvada, a drug, uh, is being used as PrEP for HIV. Uh, and you take a once daily pill uh, to prevent HIV infection. Uh, and, uh, you know, based on HRC's uh, sort of analysis, when taken every day uh, and in conjunction with other sort of uh, prevention strategies, it's been uh, shown to be more than 90% effective at preventing HIV. And uh, the regimen uh, really is just that, a once daily pill that you take. Uh, the sort of closest analogy that I draw is that PrEP is very much like the birth control pill in the sense that you take it every day to prevent an unwanted medical condition, right? Uh, and if you don't take it, it's not gonna work. Uh, so adherence is critical and it sort of fluctuates. The sort of distinction that I'll make is that PrEP uh, has a certain degree of forgivability, right? Uh, and so if you take it today and you've been taking it, um, then if you miss one dose, for instance, it's not as variable as say like the birth control pill is, for instance. Uh, and so you see a doctor, uh, the doctor will work with you to assess your uh, risk and sort of your readiness to take PrEP. And then uh, with sort of the support of your doctor, you'll begin that regimen. And uh, what it requires is usually uh, counseling, right? So risk reduction counseling, uh, you uh, get STI testing every three months, uh, and also HIV testing to make sure uh, that you haven't sort of seroconverted or that you don't have HIV before you start taking PrEP, right? It's very important that you are an HIV negative person who begins a, a PrEP regimen. And then you sort of continue to check in with your provider and work in partnership with them uh, to make sure that it's working for you. And that's sort of the, the sort of process that I underwent and continue uh, to undergo. So that's sort of a, a general overview, right? PrEP's not new. Uh, it's been proven to be more than 90% effective, uh, and it doesn't work unless you take it. That's sort of the three, I think, principles that I tend to highlight with people. I would add just a little to that um, and, and actually expound on the point that uh, PrEP is not Truvada necessarily, right? Because there's other medications that are currently under examination right now mm -hmm. um, to see whether or not they might be able to also uh, prevent HIV infection. So use of Truvada, though, has a long history, right, mm -hmm. as, as do the other products because they are actually um, HIV uh, medications. So mm -hmm. if I were infected with HIV, I would take uh, Truvada in combination with another medication. Um, and so the, the, there's a value to that is that they have a long history of use mm -hmm. and we can use a lot of their safety data. So currently what's being looked at is predominantly HIV medications to be able to see whether or not they might be able to work. The other thing I wanted to say about adherence is that it's really, uh, we know a lot more about uh, how PrEP works with when your primary exposure is rectal exposure mm -hmm. to HIV. And we know that it can be a whole lot more forgiving. Um, when you have, when your primary risk is rectal exposure. Vaginal exposure mm -hmm. is a moving target right now, and we're really trying to get a handle on what those, what the, that medicine relationship is. Um, right now, the recommendation for women is really, it probably is going to be a lot more demanding regimen in not taking more than once a day, but really sticking with that once a day, where it does appear as though um, if your primary risk of exposure mm -hmm. is rectal, um, it's a bit more forgiving. You can probably, they've, they've found that you can have very high efficacy mm -hmm. even when you manage only to take four doses a week. Mm -hmm. um, however, in the United States, it is recommended to be mm -hmm. taken daily. Mm -hmm. That is the indication. It is written and prescribed to be taken daily. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and I think you said this, um, in women, um, when they've gone back and looked at the studies, whenever uh, the drug was in women's systems and um, uh, entrenched into women who are born women uh, and women who are living as women. Uh, it uh, has also proven to be effective. But I think one of the things, and we say in the updated strategy, is the importance of developing um, uh, prevention methods uh, that are more user-friendly for women mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the importance of that especially those who may be focused, um, who may be facing interpersonal violence or uh, just who don't have the opportunity um, 
the freedom or have as much control and power over their lives. Uh, you asked us to um, talk about PEP also. PEP being post-exposure prophylaxis, which we've had for uh, quite a long time, same thing, the use of uh, HIV medication uh, treatment to prevent HIV, but th in this case, it's after one has had an exposure. And uh, it's a highly effective method that if the, shall use the word patient, if the patient uh, goes in um, within 72 hours of having or uh, suspecting of having had an exposure to HIV, uh, the patient is put on uh, this treatment, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, and it has been um, highly, highly effective at preventing people from uh, contracting uh, HIV. So, uh, and, and, and I think I'm, I'm really glad you asked the question because, as I said, we've had, I ran a health center many, many, many years ago, and we had a PEP protocol, and uh, the uptake of PEP itself uh, has never really taken mm -hmm. off in the way that we might have thought it would. Mm -hmm. So uh, that then begs the question, uh, how can we, why would we uh, expect to see uh, uptake of a pill, um, whereas one is uh, taking medication because one is really aware of having uh, had an exposure, versus uh, PrEP where you're just trying to prevent the exposure. So I think something to throw in the mix as well. Great, thank you so much. So what has been the response to PrEP as a way to prevent HIV, and in particular in the LGBTQ community? You know, I, I think it has been, it's very interesting. It's, uh, I, and a lot of what I hear is anecdotal. Uh, we're, we're still trying to gather the data. It's something that uh, moves very quickly. Uh, and I think uh, location, geographic location, uh, and acceptability are, are just all over the place. Where uh, we have seen, um, I, I was just uh, at USCA, the US Conference on AIDS, I was talking with a group of young black gay men who, one of whom was from Dallas, who shared with me that he drove from Dallas to Houston once a month or once a quarter to get his PrEP medication and support because he couldn't find uh, a provider in his, in, in Dallas, uh, with, with whom he felt comfortable discussing sex is, uh, I mean, just the range of issues that one has to uh, engage uh, in order to to successfully be on uh, the medication. I, I I came here from Chicago. I was in Chicago a couple of nights, where um, you know part of my little research just online. Uh, guys are are proudly putting it out there on prep on prep, and I think you know in the in the list of questions I was reviewing, there was something around stigma. I do think. Um, Having uh, guys feel comfortable with being on PrEP, saying they're on PrEP, uh, and, and then saying uh, their, their fear, their worry of uh, dating, uh, engaging with an HIV positive man uh, is lessened, uh, perhaps can lessen stigma over the time. But what we also know is, and, and saw um, early on, and, and it was just a few um, very uh, loud voices, but uh, but they were there, uh, really criticizing people for going on to prep, and uh, for um, that condom usage was important, and uh, that th they were going to move that people were going to move away from uh, condoms. The the research, as of now, self report is that people uh, con are continuing to use uh, condoms, uh, that uh, they're maintaining fidelity to that. I think some of that is true. I think, they're, I think people who have used condoms continue to use condoms. But we see 50,000 new HIV infections in this country a year. Somebody's not using condoms. So uh, to have a tool then that people can use if they're not going to use condoms, I think is 
uh, is remarkable and you see people taking, you see some uptake on it. Last thing I'll say is uh, in the strategy update, we laid out 10 quantitative indicators to measure our progress toward achieving the goals. We then also laid out three developmental indicators, one of which is the uptake of, PEP, of PrEP. So we will be uh, actually convening experts to, hear, um, to have conversations around that and really trying to um, doing, uh, setting a quantitative indicator and measure around the uptake of PrEP so that we can uh, monitor our progress. Great, thanks. Other panelists? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, I think we need to keep um, in the forefront that, you know, I, I hear people saying, you know, well, if it's so great, why don't people want it? Um, and I think that that's kind of a, a response to the fact that we really didn't have um, much hoopla around PrEP. I mean, PrEP uh, came to life in a very unceremonious kind of way. Um, and, and part of that was because there were some agreements to not advertise. Um, PrEP, uh, in fact, uh, as part of the uh, risk mitigation strategy, you know, drug reps didn't talk about PrEP unless they were specifically asked about it. Um, so it was a very cautious entry into this world. Um, and, and because of that, we have still very large segments of communities that don't know a thing about it. And this is compounded by how long it's taking us, public health and others, to inform people about it. Because I will get people looking at me very skeptically saying, you know, well, hey, if this has been around since 2012, what's wrong with it that I don't know about it yet? Right? So, so there must be something wrong. And think about it from a provider perspective as well. If you're not used to dealing with uh, HIV medications and a drug rep's not telling you about it, you don't get any cards about it, you don't see commercials on TV about it, again, why are people being so cautious? So I think that people interpret that in different ways, but there are some um, concerns that I definitely have that the longer it takes us to, to get people aware of PrEP, um, the more explaining it is that we have to do around it. Um, one of the reasons that we made that video that was looping and playing um, was because we were working with adolescents and they really didn't have a strong understanding whatsoever of what PrEP is. Um, and they didn't have access to educational tools at that time. So I think the onus is in part on us uh, when it comes to information and getting it out there, I think several years from now, once we've done a really good job at campaigning to raise people's literacy and education around it, if there's still low uptake, then we can talk about why is it that PrEP is, is not being you know, really used as much as we thought it could be. But right now, I think the question is on us as to why aren't we educating as vastly and intensely as we could be, not to get people on PrEP, but to make people aware that that's even an option for them. Nothing to add. <laughs> OK, well, Mr. Brooks uh, did talk a bit about this issue of one of the concerns about PrEP is that it might, in fact, lead to more condomless mm -hmm. sex. Um, in public health, we have a, a long, and I'll say sorry, history of um, controversy around harm reduction mm -hmm. efforts. And mm -hmm. um, these kinds of arguments often come up. So I don't know if any of the other panelists want to, to talk a bit about that, that issue, which is definitely in the, the discourse about PrEP. I'm happy to talk about okay. that, uh, perhaps because I might have the most uh, latitude, but um, <clears throat> in some ways. Uh, I have a friend. Uh, he, his name is Alex Gardner, and he'd be okay with me naming him. He's probably watching right now, actually. Hi, Alex. <laughs> and uh, he's a person living with HIV. He's been living with HIV for a long time. He uh, is publicly out as an advocate for people living with HIV. And he once posed a question to a group of people, um, much like this one, that I will now pose to you because he's not here. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there value in two or more men having sex with each other without a condom? And I think that is a question that has confounded public health for a very long time. Because so much of gay male sexuality, and I use gay as sort of an umbrella term for men who have sex with men, um, has been defined in relationship to the HIV epidemic. 
And PrEP, for the first time, is disentangling gay male sexuality from HIV. And that has serious sociological implications. I'll give you another example. My friend, uh, who is not a PrEP user, went to San Francisco. And he was on Grindr. And he was trying to find someone to hook up with. And he calls me. And he says, Noel. And I said, what? He's like, I'm so frustrated. I said, why? He's like, everyone is on PrEP. And I'm not. And no one uses condoms, and I do. Uh, and they're not willing to negotiate that. And it was sort of a twilight universe, right? A world in which you have men declaring that they are not going to negotiate their condom use because they weren't using condoms before. Um, condoms didn't work for them. Uh, and now, with PrEP, they have the opportunity to have the type of sex they've wanted to have for a very long time that other people are having, right? We know other people are having uh, condomless sex because all of us are in this room and probably came from parents who are having condomless sex. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it goes back to, I think, that central question, which is, is there value in two gay men having sex without a condom? Uh, I think the answer to that question for me is yes. And to the extent it is true, I think we have, one, an obligation to inform gay and bisexual men, but all people, of the opportunities of PrEP, to let them know about the risk, roots, and realities of HIV and other STIs, and to empower them to make the right decision, the best decision for themselves. And for some people, that will mean condoms plus PrEP. For some people, it will just mean condoms, and for some people, it will just mean PrEP. But I think all of those options are equally valid. And to sort of answer the question directly, um, as sort of Doug and, uh, has alluded to, we have not seen any evidence to suggest that people who are using condoms consistently before have gotten on PrEP and have abandoned them whole, wholesale, right? Um, that was not true of me, that was not true of any of my friends, that has not been true of anyone I know. Generally, there were people who were not using condoms consistently before, um, would, you know, have condomless sex with someone they were attracted to, freak out, go get PEP because they were scared of contracting HIV, and then um, repeat the process sort of three months later, right? And so, uh, I think where I'll end is that while I think it's very important for us to have conversations about the public health and policy implications of PrEP, I do think there are sociological implications of PrEP as well that we're just now beginning to understand and make sense of. I think gay and bisexual men in particular, but I think any person who identifies as queer or among the queer spectrum are having about what does it mean for me to be able to have the type of sex I've always wanted to have, but perhaps I've been afraid to have. So the, the other piece is that there's actually, um work coming out around that from qualitative interviews among the uh, participants in IPREX by Kim Kostner and others. Um, that there's, they're really unpacking um, some pretty fundamental changes uh, among PrEP users of how they experience relationships. And it's very much back to what Noel was just saying of, you know, when your sex and sexuality has been constructed so much around fear of HIV, imagine taking that fear away. Um, and that's a very profoundly different experience for people when you can, as, as some of them have been quoted as saying, you know, it gets HIV out of the room um, and allows me to stay in the room. So we're just getting a handle on, on how PrEP use can really shift uh, the, the depth of relationships um, that people have, uh, as well as what they're willing to let themselves experience. So I think we need to be really cautious uh, because some people conflate, they, they hear our messages about PrEP being effective as part of a combination uh, package. Sometimes people infer that that means that I need to be a 100% all the time condom user, or that if I go get PrEP, I'm gonna be told now take this every day and wear a condom every single time. And I think we need to back off a little bit from that and really think about what's gonna work for you and really adopt a true um, you know, sexual health kind of perspective, sex positive perspective, um, and a risk reduction perspective. I, I appreciated your um, also bringing it back to the context of loving relationships. And so I'm a person who's been living with HIV for 25 years. And the idea of, I mean, you know, you're young people. I'm assuming some of you are um, sexually uh, active. And <laughs> Just imagine uh, being in a situation where you're with someone um, for whom you care, um, for whom you're hot, and, uh, 
But then having this thing running around in your head, oh, I need to be careful, oh, I don't want to get this person sick, oh, I don't want to infect this person, um, that makes it, you know, makes for not a fun sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, the importance of thinking about this, and so when you think about um, women in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, or, or just women right here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who uh, may have uh, HIV positive partners, mm -hmm. uh, who are able to take uh, medication to um, protect herself, protect themselves, uh, for gay men who are, I think it, what also happens is this gets tied into a promiscuity, mm -hmm. uh, and you know what promiscuous is, right? It's anybody who's having more sex than me. <laughs> um, but uh, to have, uh, it gets tied up in a promiscuity conversation mm -hmm. instead of a, uh, a, a relationship mm -hmm. conversation and wanting, as we all do, to protect the mm -hmm. ones that we love mm -hmm. and with whom we're um, intimately involved. Great, thanks, and nice segue into the, the next question for the panel. So we know um, HIV is not just a medical disease, it's also a social, economic, and legal issue. So how does PrEP address issues um, with HIV beyond the medical impact, mm. issues such as stigmatization, um, et cetera? Um, yeah, well, I will be brief. I don't, I don't know that it does. I, 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 I said what I thought around how it uh, can uh, help eliminate stigma in that um, people who are on PrEP who are feeling protected uh, perhaps feel less concerned about uh, engaging with someone who's HIV positive, being uh, in a sexual relationship with someone who's positive. Um, you know, I, when I think about... Uh, prep in relation to uh, to those other to the social determinants. I don't know that I have an answer. I mean, my immediate response is it's not. But uh, hopefully, these two really smart people will take <laughs> me on on that. Um, so, from from my perspective, uh, what I really enjoy is having the conversation. And I feel like even just in in the last ten years, um, the the community conversation has shifted from being very silent about HIV um, mm -hmm. to really having a lot to say. Mm -hmm. So I do think that having PrEP, um, also the realization that having someone, um, you know, if someone's able to reach durable viral suppression or if they can control their HIV and that will reduce transmission um, as well, we have these opportunities to talk about, um, about controlling HIV. Um, so I think in, in the sense of PrEP, um, that maybe it helps that conversation, maybe it gets people talking, maybe it allows for more conversations about status that is not alienating, mm -hmm. um, not fear-inducing. Um, so I don't know, we'll see, um, but I think it has the potential. Yeah, for me, I think, you know, the only thing I'll add is, uh, you know, looking at PrEP through, you know, what, what one might call like an intersectional lens, um, insofar as I think PrEP, um, my, I have a lot of really smart friends and I quote them often. And so another one of my friends uh, once said that PrEP illuminates, um, you know, because pe people talk a lot about how hard PrEP can be to access. And I think what PrEP illuminates is sort of some of the broader challenges facing our country when it comes to healthcare provision. Um, and so for example, what do I mean by that? Uh, what does it mean to try to access PrEP in a state that hasn't expanded Medicaid? Uh, what does it mean to try to access PrEP uh, if the only sort of provider of sexual and reproductive services in your area is Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood is under attack? Um, what does it mean if you're trying to access PrEP as a transgender woman, uh, but you engage in survival sex work, uh, and so you are uh, picked up by the police, and so that sort of disrupts your ability to access the prep that you have, right? Or um, that you uh, are, you know, um, uh, how, uh, have, are experiencing housing instability uh, because you face discrimination in so many facets of your life, uh, including healthcare. Let's say you encounter a doctor who is a transphobe, right, and has no idea how to uh, sort of 
talk to you about your body or the type of sex you want to have or the, makes assumptions about the types of sex you're having based on your body, right? So I do think that in some ways PrEP illuminates um, some pre-existing challenges that face the LGBT community in particular, but I think people broadly. Uh, and so often, I, you know, one of my friends, uh, Alex, and, and others talks about PrEP as sort of a gateway into issue into understanding sort of the state of healthcare in America, right, and all of the sort of corresponding pieces that go along with it. And I don't know if addressing PrEP will sort of in turn address poverty or in turn address, you know, housing instability, but I do think addressing housing instability can only sort of strengthen people's ability to access and use PrEP, right? I do think addressing uh, housing discrimination and discrimination against transgender people and health insurance will only strengthen their ability to access and use PrEP, right? So I do think that the inverse is true, that the more we create an infrastructure that supports people living whole and meaningful and sort of um, healthy lives will in turn impact their ability to use this to its you know, full potential. Great. Thanks. We uh, have already had a lot of questions coming in Oof. from the audience, so I'm going to move on to that. I also want to remind people who are watching online, if you have questions uh, for the panel, please tweet them to the hashtag umishprep, one word. Um, let's talk about affordability of prep. Mm -hmm. Sort of in general, how much does it cost? How are people paying for it now? And an audience member wanted to know, with the recent um, stories in the news about uh, huge inflation of, mm. of, you know, prescription drug prices in some case. Um, what can be done to make sure that doesn't happen for this life-saving drug? So um, most uh, insurance plans uh, and Medicaid does cover PrEP. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is coverage out there. Now, where we are in, and the manufacturer actually just actually changed it. It mm -hmm. has had a patient assistance program and has just uh, increased uh, the benefits of that program in the last um, few weeks. Uh, and, but there, there are still people where the problem comes in is around co-pays and cost sharing that we see in uh, the Affordable Care Act and uh, in certain plans, uh, and, uh, and then income. So uh, the, the patient assistance program from the manufacturer, um, I think is now, has gone up, benefits people up to 40% of federal poverty level, which I think comes to about $55,000. Uh, so a person can make up to $55,000 a year and still be eligible for that patient assistance program. And I think they just uh, made that, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I think the maximum uh, benefit from that is $3,600 uh, a year, which is uh, could be very helpful. But I, I was just talking with someone last night who said uh, he was um, his cost sharing was about $400 a month. Uh, now, we went on to, to talk and uh, understood that it was sort of um, the way he had applied for mm -hmm. his own program and he will, he will be able to access the, the patient assistance program uh, this coming um, year. And, and I would be remiss if mm -hmm. I didn't stop mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. and say that open enrollment mm -hmm. has started mm -hmm. for the... <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the Affordable Care Act, and uh, please, please, please uh, go to, you're, you're probably all um, coming, uh, probably enjoying the benefit of the Affordable Care Act of still being on your parents' insurance uh, until you're 26, but if you have your own, um, open enrollment is right now, and uh, please enroll. Uh, so there's still some work, I mean, there, there are a lot of conversations right now around drug pricing, and uh, we have uh, many of the advocates are working on that. The, the incident of which I'm sure many of you are aware uh, that has been in the news over the past few weeks uh, certainly has drawn attention and led some of the presidential candidates to say that uh, the issue is something, the issue of drug pricing mm -hmm. is something they want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it is, I, I, I think it's something that's there to, for us to examine. Right, great. Thanks. So, um, 
What's being done to, if anything, to educate medical providers so they're well equipped and know how to introduce PrEP to patients, get them on, the, on it? Um, and then also are there adverse side effects that need to be medically managed and providers need to have, have training to do that adequately as well? I, I can speak to a thing for, um, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but we are, we at the White House are having conversations with uh, various people about setting up, uh, and not just PrEP, but prevention centers of excellence where providers would be trained, uh, um, front desk personnel would be trained. I mean, there are a range of opportunities to uh, to educate people. I, I think it is, and, and we hear from, we hear from young gay men often that they go into a room and are, in fact, are stigmatized, mm -hmm. are, uh, I, I might even say, discriminated against, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they're, they're questioned when they ask about PrEP. Uh, they have uh, are told that uh, they don't need to do that, they just need to behave or um, any range of things. So uh, we certainly have, and I think this um, ties right into, we have a very long way to go in educating um, prescribers, uh, primary care providers, who, uh, as Rive said earlier, may not have HIV uh, positive people in their patient, on, on their panel, in their patient population. So uh, there, there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done on that, and it's not easy. Um, speaking of friends, uh, my friends at Fenway Community Health Center in Boston where actually one of the uh, study leads, Ken Mayer, uh, um, practices at Fenway. Um, it's an LGBT, uh, uh, mostly LGBT community health center, very progressive. And the president of Fenway, uh, Steve Boswell, told me uh, um, back when we were in Vancouver that uh, the work that they had to do to bring their staff along, to bring the medical staff along in uh, understanding, prescribing, uh, introducing PrEP was, uh, was quite significant. And when you have an institution that is um, at that level of quality, interest, it's a research, it's a research institute as well, uh, it, it means that uh, we have a lot of work to do. So um, we recently convened a meeting among um, different members of the HIV community in Michigan um, last week, I think it was, and we were discussing uh, different notions for how we would really be able to educate people about PrEP and providers because we hear that story over and over again of, you know, either I can't find it or it's just so shaming to go through the process that, thanks so much, I'm going to yeah. pass. Um, and I do know, and I, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe it was the health department that just got a CDC grant. Um, and that grant, I believe, they are going to be targeting towards educating That's right. providers. That's true. Um, and so they're going to be looking at what needs to happen there. Now, I think we need to be thoughtful about what providers um, and the ones that Doug was just talking about make a lot of sense to me, frontline, um, HIV testing counselors, uh, people working at STD clinics or family planning clinics. I think ID docs already know what they're doing. So infectious disease doctors who are used to treating and working with these medications, um, I, they're kind of on the forefront in terms of working with the partners of individuals who are living with HIV when the partner is negative. Um, what we do see here uh, in, in Michigan, uh, right here, uh, is we do see a novel kind of strategies emerging, like, like I might be your family physician, I'm not comfortable prescribing PrEP to you, but I might be willing to work with that infectious disease doc at the HIV clinic if you see them first, have them go through the criteria, make sure that you really meet criteria, maybe meet with you the first couple times, and then there's a handoff uh, to a provider uh, that, that was not comfortable enough with prescribing it, although would be comfortable with monitoring it. So these are baby steps, right? That's not a long-term solution at all. Certainly not efficient or an effective way of doing things, but as other providers get used to 
hey, you know, this is a drug that I can manage and that I can watch out for. Um, you did ask about side effects. I mean, there's certainly you want to watch out for um, liver functioning. You want to, I don't think bone density testing um, is a requirement, mm -hmm. I don't think, but you may want to look out for bone density. Um, you want someone, obviously, to test you for, uh, for HIV each time because that's not a side effect, but if you're kind of intermittent and taking PrEP and then you do get infected and then you kind of become intermittent on PrEP again, you do run the risk of developing resistance um, to that class of medications. Um, but, you know, these are cases that I think people deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so training is getting out there. Um, people need to give people opportunities and time to get more comfortable. Um, and by way of shaming and other things, we need to demand and advocate for that being unacceptable. And I'll pass it over to you because... Great. I just want to make two quick points that I think sort of riff off uh, both of what you're saying. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, for me, it was reassuring to hear that side effects are rare and reversible, right? So if there happens to be an instance of where, you know, Truvada is sort of, for example, affecting your liver, um, you can stop taking the drug and the damage is reversible, right? So I just, so... Um, that's why sort of you get routine monitoring and, and lab testing. And if your doctor sort of, and I have had friends who have had sort of, you know, rare, again, but it happens. They've had some liver issues. Their doctor stopped taking the Truvada for a few months. The liver functioning went back to normal. And then they reassessed, right? Um, the second thing I'll add, and, and I love my provider community, so I do not want this to come across as um, a, a sort of a critique from a, from a, from a bad place. But if I, I would be remiss if, as an advocate, I didn't say this. Uh, you know, my friends and I often talk about, you know, the importance of not having PrEP go the way of abortion, where um, you have to go to this isolated um, clinic, um, sort of off the beaten path, um, and constantly be judged and shamed from sort of being outside the door, walking into the door, and then in the room being shamed. Uh, you know, any, any provider who can write a prescription can write you a prescription for PrEP. What I often see is that infectious disease doctors will have people come to them and ask for PrEP, and they'll say, but you don't have an infectious disease, so why are you here, right? Go to the primary care, go to the primary care doctor, because this is a preventative tool. And the primary care doc will say, well, I'm not an HIV specialist, so go to the infectious disease doctor. Uh, and it creates this back and forth that's not helpful. So while I think it's important to come up with solutions in the interim that get people the access that they need, I would hate for it to end up being the case that the only place you can get PrEP is an infectious disease doctor, because that's not how it should be, right? And we've already seen the implications of what happens when a standard medical procedure like abortion becomes politicized um, and becomes sort of hard to access, right? We see that playing out today uh, with women's sexual and reproductive health. Yeah. And the, the CDC guidelines that are available are clearly for any provider. Right. It is not specific to a certain kind of provider. Great. Thanks. So d what do we know looking at how different localities, states, um, globally different countries um, have uh, rolled out education, implementation efforts. What, what do we know about sort of the best practices? Uh, and then from Twitter, I want to add a kind of a follow-on okay. question from that, um, asking how is it that Truvada is available in the U.S. but not in Canada, a decidedly more progressive country <laughs> with a robust <laughs> healthcare system? Good, good question. Do you want to start? Uh, okay, I'm going to try to tackle the international part. Okay, got it. Um, so uh, I believe that there are several countries that are pushing for uh, Truvada to receive approval for use as PrEP right now. However, the U.S. is the only country um, where we have that approval and that indication, for that indication. Um, that's not to say that South Africa, for example, is not trying really hard for that. Um, Thailand, I believe, as well. Uh, Canada, I would imagine, <laughs> is pushing for that. Well, as their well. new prime minister might help that along. Uh, yeah, he's, that's he's true. Very progressive. That's true. Yes. Um, but but yeah. So so the process though is is a slow process and it's a regulatory process and and um, you know as much as we'd like to say that that should be it, it should be faster um, than it is. Um, however, right now it is just the U.S. So we can't really speak too much about what the rollout will be um, from that public health perspective, but there are many demonstration projects mm -hmm. going on 
Um, and that is really going to help the rollout because some of the things that we realized in doing some of the PrEP trials, um, for example, the ADAPT study, which was open label PrEP in Cape Town, is that there's a fair degree of skepticism um, that that is fair, and I mean fair as in it's a just um, skepticism and caution towards biomedical prevention or what might be considered Western medicine for prevention in countries where the social and political history has been one of pretty severe discrimination and um, and other factors there that really, we have a lot to think about when we think about rolling out in countries where that's really not the norm and that there's reason to be skeptical. I'm very hopeful and actually believe that we will be able to do so, but we're gonna do it probably a little bit differently than what we might be looking at in the US. Um, but do you wanna talk about the rollouts sure. in the US? Yeah, okay. and then Douglas, feel free to jump in. Um, you might, you travel much more extensively than I do. Uh, I mean, I think the cities that I'm well aware of, so uh, places that you might think, right? So New York City is, I think, leading the way in a lot of their prep advocacy efforts. Uh, you know, I know of a lot of my colleagues in New York um, who are trying really innovative models. So for, exen for instance, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, it was talked about earlier how, you know, um, uh, the manufacturer is not like going to, to doctors, right, and educating about the drug. So like the New York Health Department has done that, right? They go, they're educating doctors, and they do follow-up visits to see like, are you administering PrEP? Like are more of your patients accessing PrEP, right? So they're doing some really innovative research and evaluation and data collection. Uh, San Francisco is leading the country in a lot of PrEP um, advocacy efforts. Um, LA County and the city of Los Angeles, the city of West Hollywood, but also some other places. Um, so for example, Mississippi um, has a, a, a call center, right, where clinicians in Mississippi can call and get PrEP access, and that's one of the only sort of um, examples of it, of it in its kind, especially in the Deep South. Um, and so I, I, and I know of colleagues in uh, sort of red state areas um, who are making moves quietly, uh, but indeed making moves to try to expand um, access to PrEP. Um, I, I'll end with sort of two models that are being held up. One, you know, Washington State, for instance, um, has something called PrEP App. Uh, which is essentially a state-funded program, and I think it's important to highlight, underscore, and italicize that. It is a state-funded program uh, that you can meet a certain set of criteria, and if you're eligible, the state of Washington will pay for your PrEP and PrEP-related services entirely. Um, and New York has created a similar program where they don't pay for the actual drug, but they'll pay for all of the sort of cost sharing that Douglas alluded to. They'll pay for your co-pays, your lab visits, um, because in their rationale, they partner with the manufacturer to use those payment assistance programs. So they pay, for, the manufacturer pays for the drug, New York State pays for the rest, right? That's sort of the model that's worked in New York. Um, so I think more and more states are looking to create similar types of program, but again, those are state funded. Uh, and as more and more states sort of divest dollars, this is, I think, a policy issue, as more and more states divest money away from public health and specifically prevention, uh, that spells big challenges uh, for states um, who don't have the, the money or the resources to provide, uh, create programs like this. A really good example is Illinois, uh, where the, uh, and this is sort of an example of elections matter, uh, under a Democratic governor, um, the state of Illinois is ready to roll out its version of um, sort of the Washington program, prep for Illinois. Uh, Illinois then re elected a Republican governor who then sort of uh, took that money out of the budget and that program is not going forward anymore. Um, so I think that also is a dimension uh, of the conversation. But Washington State, New York, San Francisco, LA are some places I would look to for guidance. Great, thanks. So here's a tweet from someone in our web-based audience. The Scruff app now allows people to indicate their preferred HIV prevention measure, including PrEP, and their profiles. Mm -hmm. What other tools are being used to spread the word, and who's engaging those stakeholders? Well, I mean, I'm, how many of you saw How to Get Away with Murder, right? Uh, in the episode where, no, raise your hands. Like, I'm curious to know how many of you saw the episode, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think, it, you know, I always was, I was talking with a friend and, and, you know, we said, you know, it's a sign of true cultural acceptance when, you know, prep appears in primetime television, right? Uh, it's a sign that the tide is changing. Uh, and it's a storyline that's been running for, you know, a couple episodes, so it's not sort of just a one-time mention. Uh, so I know that there are, and I think, you know, in terms of representation matters, uh, the showrunner, the head writer for How to Go With Murder is a gay man. And he talks about has, how he felt a responsibility, Peter Nowak, uh, to include a prep storyline in How to Go Away with Murder, right? Um, so I think representation matters uh, in that instance. And uh, uh, you know, there are advocates, LGBT advocates, meeting with the heads of Grinder and Scruff and Jacked 
and other sort of online dating profiles. And I think they all feel sort of, a, to varying degrees, but they all feel um, a sense of social responsibility, right? That our apps um, have made it more efficient and effective for people to meet each other. And so um, we have a social responsibility to help people do that in the safest way. So I think you'll begin to see more uh, apps and app companies roll out measures in, in the next year. The other place is online. Um, so we've tried to do, and, and many people um, have put uh, different angles of, of prep education uh, online, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere from like stories that people mm -hmm. can experience, mm -hmm. um, you know, what people have gone through, what their experiences were. I mean, our, the, the What is Prep video mm -hmm. is a really boring website. I mean, it's a website that has one page and it's got a video and yet we've had thousands of visits there. We've had hundreds of requests for the video. So I think people want the information. Um, so I think online, certainly social um, networking opportunities, and then also getting into the community. Yes. So I think like visibility in the community as well, um, and giving people an opportunity to ask questions is, is really, really helpful. And without sounding like I'm, we're patting ourselves on the back too much. <laughs> um, Go ahead and pat away. Yeah, no, actually, I was just reading something today, but I can't remember where I was reading it, uh, that the updated strategy leaning into PrEP in the way that mm -hmm. it does yep. uh, has really given a lift uh, around the country and, um, and helped rate, yes. um, lift the conversation. So um, you may also read the updated national HIV AIDS strategy. I mean, I think uh, just on that point, it says something that the President of the United States talks about sort of HIV and black gay men, right? I think it says something uh, that a person living with HIV is the head of the Office of National AIDS Policy. I think it says something that gay and bisexual men, transgender women, um, queer people are visible and represented throughout the national HIV AIDS strategy, right? So I think it underscores again my point that elections matter, representation matters, uh, and I think it has done, I, in my world, it has made an enormous difference, um, the, national, the updated national HIV and AIDS strategy. So I, I do thank you, Douglas, for your leadership on that and, and the White House and, and President Obama as well. I wasn't looking for that. <laughs> but he got it, so. Great. Well, Mr. Brooks, could you elaborate a bit more on how your office is discussing and promoting the use of PrEP among women? Um, so I, I said earlier that uh, we very clearly state uh, in the strategy, the importance of uh, continuing. So we talk about research and uh, looking at, and, and you know, this conversation is about PrEP, but we also uh, talk about microbicides and vaccines and uh, um, um, options for women that uh, work for women. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we lay that out uh, very clearly. And, uh, and we engaged uh, one of the groups, um, the actually the only topical uh, conversation uh, held uh, as we were, we were receiving information from around the country and preparing for this, uh, for the strategy was with the National Black Women's HIV AIDS Network, uh, where I convened them at the White House to hear directly from them uh, the importance of, uh, of, of, of PrEP and uh, prevention and services for women. And uh, many of their recommendations uh, actually ended up in the strategy. In addition to that, I should say that on World AIDS Day, we will be releasing the federal action plan uh, that the executive order that released this strategy called for agencies across the U.S. government to report back to the president um, within 100 days on their action plans for implementing the strategy. And uh, certainly the Office of Women's Health uh, is involved in that as well as NIH. And uh, we will see very concrete actions from uh, the U.S. government and from uh, and, and its uh, relative agencies on this issue. So the, the CDC is also launching a, a large demonstration project um, targeting women, right, in the United States, and that should allow us to, to gather a lot more information about PrEP with women. And, and there are ongoing studies, we should, uh, I think that's um, through NIH uh, and, uh, and, and other private sources as well. Oh, oh and I will add, um, because I think we've talked about it, but I, I want to be very explicit um, that 
we do not know enough about sort of the role of PrEP in transgender women um, and transgender people generally. You know, I alluded to earlier that transgender women are 49 times more likely to have HIV than uh, the non-transgender uh, population. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. But one, uh, there was actually um, a new sort of analysis done um, of the IPREX study, which was a major study that included uh, gay and bisexual men and also transgender women. And they went back and pulled out sort of all the participants who looked at transgender women and saw, one, that PrEP worked for the transgender woman who, who took it. But one of the main concerns that was found is that there was a fear that sort of no one knew what would happen if you took PrEP and how it would affect their hormones, right? And so a number of transgender women were um, apprehensive about getting on PrEP because their immediate question was, well, how, this, how will this affect my hormones? And the, the answer to that question is we don't know because we don't have very good research or data on transgender women, partially because researchers often conflate transgender women with men who have sex with men. So when they study sort of transgender women's health, they lump them in with the men who have sex with men because of their anatomy and don't study them as women, right? These are people living as women who identify as women, who move through the world as women, and yet they're categorized as men who have sex with men. The same thing happens to transgender men who are categorized as women, right? Um, so I think this highlights uh, and illustrates the need for research that is responsive to the needs of transgender people and sort of um, research as transgender people according to their gender identity, not according to some uh, researcher's bias about how they want to categorize people. Thank you. So I'd now like to read another very compelling question from our <laughs> terrific audience. In light of the growing racial disparities in HIV transmission, particularly among young gay and bi black and Latino men and trans women, as well as the stark structural inequalities as exemplified by the Detroit metro area mm -hmm. and other places, what strategies might be used to address the disparities among this population? Is PrEP a realistic strategy for people who lack other basic needs? So I'm gonna start and let you guys finish. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smart strategy. <laughs> One of the things that, that people reflect on um, that PrEP appears to be able to do, see all the caution in how I'm saying that, <laughs> um, is that it's, it's an opportunity to get someone's foot in the door yes. who have never been in the door for preventative or, or any other really kind of care aside from the most urgent care you know possibly needed. So one of the things that we're seeing is an increasing number of individuals who otherwise are left out completely mm -hmm. from the care system actually engaging in care. And I think we don't know what the, what the long-term effects of that might be. I think the immediate effects are that we are wrapping around services. We are hooking in to places where there are resources available. Uh, people are getting screened for other conditions as well. We're hoping that if the interaction is positive enough, that we might be developing cadres of individuals who were otherwise completely unrepresented, now becoming better represented within the systems of care. That you know, it really might be an opportunity uh, if the pieces fall into place. We know at least right now, regardless, um, it is getting people into care. Um, and subsequently, in places where it's possible, it's getting them insurance um, mm -hmm. where they didn't have it mm -hmm. before, especially if they want to get PrEP. Um, so it has a lot of benefits in, in that particular area. I, I'm sure I'm not covering all of them. I mean, I, that was going to be sort of my answer, uh, sort of the gateway. You know, uh, I, I, the only thing I'll sort of add or, or do is contextualize it in my own experience. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I grew up poor. I grew up black, obviously. Uh, and I grew up uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and my family didn't have health insurance. We were uninsured. Uh, or we were on Medicaid for a long time. And uh, the only time we went to the doctor was when something was wrong. Um, I didn't have a relationship to sort of the, the healthcare system in a way that I understood to be preventative, right? I only went to the doctor when something was wrong, um, partially because that was the only time, you know, that uh, my mother sort of had been socialized to believe it made sense to go to a doctor, but also because that kept costs down, right, very practically speaking. Uh, and so uh, I can see I, in, my, in my own life how PrEP has changed my relationship to sort of 
the healthcare system. Uh, and that I don't know if it would have happened were it not for sort of prep uh, in this way. And so, it, you know, I'll end with sort of the statement that I alluded to earlier. I don't know if prep uh, is sort of perpetuating sort of the structural inequities, but it certainly is illuminating and, and illuminating and revealing how pressing it is for us to fix it, especially if people start to demand, the people who are on the margin start to demand access to it. And then we say, oh, but we don't have insurance to give you, or oh, um, we don't have subsidies to give you, or oh, we don't have providers in your area, right? Like that, I think, sort of is just a further indictment of the system uh, and more reason for uh, advocates to rally around. Um, and by advocates, I also mean all of you, uh, in addition to the people on this panel. All right, I think we might have time for two more questions if we're brief mm -hmm. on it. Um, so first of the two, um, do you envision prep to be a lifelong thing for a user or something people would use more in moments of risk in their life? Um, the lead researcher on the IPREC study, which brought us prep, Dr. Bob Grant, uh, is, um, is my friend, is uh, a, a wonderful man who is, uh, is a, a brilliant researcher, brilliant physician, but rooted also in, uh, in social justice mm -hmm. and uh, equality. And Bob talks about seasons of risk that uh, there are times, and I think this, this connects to what I was saying earlier, there are times when, um, when a person may be leaving a relationship mm -hmm. and uh, wants to explore and uh, wants to protect herself or himself. Uh, there are times when, um, I think there are some people, maybe people who are in long-term relationships with someone, a negative person who's in a long-term committed relationship with someone who's HIV positive, maybe that person is going to be on PrEP for the remainder of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think for some people, I, and, and, and some of this, I, I try to be really careful with this because it, it puts my opinion out there in a, in a, in a way. Uh, but for me, ideally, uh, a person takes uh, PrEP uh, to protect uh, herself, himself, uh, until she or he is in a committed relationship where uh, they can negotiate um, how they're going to be in that relationship. It may mean the continuation of PrEP, or it may mean they're in a situation where they don't need it any longer. So uh, I think it depends on... Um, Depends on the person, uh, but I, I ideally, uh, I don't think this was something that was uh, is is meant to be um, the be all and end all uh, forever. Uh, but who knows? Maybe maybe it will be. But okay. Last question for our terrific panelists. If you were hired as an advisor or consultant to the University of Michigan. What advice would you give to the university health system to mm -hmm. provide access and appropriate uptake of PrEP in our community? So the White House is not going to weigh in <laughs> <laughs> on the University of Michigan's um, healthcare system. Other than to say, I think uh, any healthcare system, especially one that is situated in uh, a top-notch uh, American university, uh, certainly would want to provide information to the patients who are coming uh, in and out of the doors. Thanks. Um, I would say that we have an obligation to implement CDC guidelines. Um, it, it's not negotiable. Um, these are the guidelines. They need to be implemented. And I think that we're getting yeah, there. I mean, like I said, there was, uh, I was referring to our own health system when I was talking about Jamie Riddell, who hopefully he's not watching, um, <laughs> <laughs> at the HIV treatment site where, where he does, he works with, um, with the health 
clinic to be able to kind of toggle people back and forth so that they are able to get it. But at the end of the day, these are guidelines that our government is telling us that we need to implement. Um, and like any other guideline, we need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to hold uh, the people that we can accountable for implementing the national guideline. Including for testing. Including for testing right. as well. And so I would say that we need to start double checking that any testing that we do um, certainly includes an evaluation and potential discussion of PrEP. Anytime someone's coming in for STI testing, STD testing, or treatment, absolutely talk about PrEP. If someone's coming for PEP, absolutely talk about PrEP. Um, and I think that there's no harm done in having the conversation. And rectal gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. Rectal gonorrhea as well. <laughs> or oral gonorrhea. Or oral gonorrhea. So I think the point being um, that, that you lose nothing by having the conversation. So I, I think that we need to really facilitate and do what we need to do to just start having the conversation. That's right. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, we had many more questions we didn't get to get to, so I apologize to everyone in the audience. We couldn't get to all your terrific questions. Uh, my time here is done, but I'm going to pass on the microphone to Michael Manansala, who will end our fun time here together. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you to our panelists for being here and engaging us in this uh, very timely and very important discussion. Um, I'm sure you guys have a lot more questions and I hope that you guys um, uh, sort of continue on the conversation beyond the walls of this school. Um, I just wanna thank uh, everyone again for coming. I wanna specifically thank um, all the out groups on campus, um, Outbreak for creating um, a wonderful uh, Prep 101 material. Stephen, thank you for designing that. Um, that was very, very great. Um, out MD as well, OSTEM, um, Out for Business, Outlaws, um, Lambda grads. Uh, thank you so much for bringing in uh, everyone, all your constituents. I really appreciate your, your presence. Um, feel free to um, get some materials out. So there are a lot of materials uh, on PrEP on HIV prevention and uh, sexual well-being outside uh, in the Great Hall. Um, and at 9 o'clock, we will have a post-panel uh, happy hour at Circus Bar, the Daily Blue campaign um, sponsored by the HRC will also uh, be running there as well. And I, I do, I'm so sorry, I know I'm supposed to be brief, but I have to say, I mean, I'm local, so I am at the School of Public Health. I also work at the Sex Lab. Um, so both myself and other people I work with are very invested in getting this word out. So if you have ideas, if you have some thoughts about, you know, getting trainings out there, you know, really calling people to task on this, come and see us. We are available to you. We are part of this community. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that, that everyone's aware of that uh, before we close. So thanks. thanks. And on that note, let's give our panelists another round of applause. Thank you, Dean Lance, for moderating this event. <laughs>